I'm Danny. I work for Shopify. Uh, and I'm going to talk about building an on-premise Kubernetes cluster. Uh, this is, of course, work I did as a team, so I'll do my best for the parts I didn't do, but ask me questions at the end, and it should go smoothly. So, quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, what is Kubernetes? If you're already on the hype train, don't worry, this will go quickly. If not, hopefully this will make you interested in it. Uh, talk a little bit why you might want to run Kubernetes. We'll also talk about why you might not want to run Kubernetes. And we'll use our big Rails application as an example, but I think a lot of you will find the sort of pieces of this relevant. Uh, we'll talk about why we wanted to run our own cluster. And obviously, you'd also want to talk about why you might not want to run your own cluster. But I think in order to do that intelligently, you need to know what goes into building your own cluster. So we'll skip to that. And then at the very end, we'll wrap it up with sort of a good overview of what's going on. So jumping right in, uh, Kubernetes is an open source container management platform. It makes it super easy to deploy your containers, to scale them up, and to multiplex your hardware. And this has been the promise for a long time, and it seems like it's really here. On top of that, it has a nice service discovery layer, which is sort of the bane of every distributed systems problem underneath the covers, and uh, has configuration management built in from first principles. So a couple of quick terms. Uh, Kubernetes has what they call a node. It's best thought of as a server or a virtual server, and even though it's a container management platform, you still have to acknowledge that servers exist. Um, then there is the pod. A pod is gonna be one or more containers that are uh, deployed together, if you will. So I'll give you some ideas of the colors. The blue box here is gonna be your node, your server. The green would be your pod. And then the red's gonna be your um, actual container. So you might just deploy Redis by itself, that makes sense. But you might also deploy your big Rails app along with Site Nginx so you can do SSL termination smoothly. Past that, uh, there is the service. This is another Kubernetes resource. Uh, the easiest conceptual way to think about this is perhaps a DNS name that if you use will uh, route robin load balance to one or more pods that match it. Um, it actually does a lot more than that, but we'll start there and get into the depths of what it can, everything it can do later on. And finally, ingress. So a service is gonna be local to the cluster only, and so obviously you wanna get requests into your cluster, especially if you have a Rails app. Uh, and so ingress is the resource that will bridge the internet uh, to your services. And again, there's a lot more than just this quick outline I've given you, but I think that's enough to get us started. So with that, why might you wanna use Kubernetes? And for us, we already use containers. And if you already use containers, you probably already have your own container management system. And ours works, but it has some limitations. It's really only designed to run our big monolith. And as we get bigger, we're adding more services that are not just in our monolith. Uh, it scales at the whole unit of a host. So you wanna get more resources, you actually have to bring up a whole new server. There's no multiplexing of hardware here at all. And as a big downside, it's not open source. So if it wants to get better, we have to put in the effort. And then we can't share it with the rest of you. So Kubernetes is looking really appealing. On the other hand, there's some reasons not to. Uh, so Rails has long running jobs, things like database migrations or data migrations. I'm sure these exist in lots of other frameworks. And Kubernetes doesn't like this. It wants to, when you do a deploy, tear down all of the old pods and bring up new ones. And it does this in a way, of course, where you don't have downtime. But if you have long running things, you need to leave your old pods running and you're fighting against the framework. And I should say with all of these, they're not necessarily insurmountable. They're just things you need to be aware of and decide if they're worth the trade offs. Um, some other things is, we said we, you know, our scaling is an entire host. And so some of our resiliency patterns sort of understand, okay, there's this many hosts, there's this many processes, and so we can do things like bulkheading with understanding of, okay, this is how many total processes are running in the system. And with Kubernetes, now that we're deploying in much less than a host, we end up having to go back and revisit some of these assumptions. And again, it's not insurmountable, it's just upfront work you have to pay. And then finally, if you came to any of other talks, or the lightning talk last night, you probably got to see spy or chat ops bot. And so this is another uh, thing that can do way more than you saw. Like, for example, we can use it to flush our caches, right? It can actually reach into memcache or Redis and start doing things. And so if you put your Redis and memcache into Kubernetes, you either need to put an ingress for those services, and that seems crazy, like I don't think we wanna expose Redis to the internet. You need to either then, you could move your chat bot into Kubernetes as well, and now you've gotta move two things at once, or poke holes other ways. And so like I said, there's a lot of sort of ancillary baggage that comes along with going to Kubernetes, and it's worth being aware of what it is up front. With all that being said, we definitely jumped in, and so we got to ask the next question. Should we run our own cluster or not? Uh, so Shopify runs out of two data centers, and if you think the depreciation on a car is bad, wait till you see what it is on a used server, uh, you may as well just take it to the scrap heap. And so it was really unexciting to think about just throwing away two data centers full of hardware. Uh, beyond that, 
Uh, cloud pricing is competitive, but it may not be quite as cheap as running your own data center. Try to get back, that past your CTO and see if he notices. Uh, but there's more than just money, right? Because I think for most of us, money is not my problem. I want technical reasons. Uh, so for that, um, in the data center, there's one change at a time, right? We could move our stateless applications into Kubernetes and leave our databases where they are. It's easy to connect resources outside of Kubernetes. And there's no more pain in the round trips, right? We're using the same servers in the same locations as before, so our latencies aren't going up. Whereas if we just move one piece at a time into the cloud, we're now gonna have latency from wherever the cloud provider is to our data center and back, and latency hurts. And then beyond that, we also have security and privacy. Uh, our data centers are basically firewalled off. We can communicate from all servers to all servers in the clear if we'd like to. And this is really nice if you run software or services that don't do SSL very well, or you don't want to even pay the small penalty of actually, you know, your CPU bound applications don't want to pay a penalty for doing even more work, which is encryption. And so that adds up at scale too. And the other thing is trust, right? Uh, we have PII from our merchants, we have customer data, and if this ever got out, leaked, or we lost it, it'd be really bad for us, it'd be bad for our merchants, and it could be really good for our competitors. So uh, we're trying to avoid that sort of thing. So there's a lot of trust if you're not gonna build your own. So we thought, we looked at the list, we thought, you know, it's at least worth figuring out what goes into building a cloud. It might, or sorry, building it on-premise and doing it ourselves. And so we determined those before big pieces of work, and I'll go through these, and it's not an instruction manual for the rest of the slides. Don't worry about that. I'm just gonna point out what they are and some interesting things we found along the way that hopefully if you do it yourself, this will save you a little bit of time, but not make you bored. And then after we go through this, we can sort of really talk about, does this make, you know, why not run it once you know what goes into that? So, what the heck is a master node? Well, I'll tell you that a master node is a node in the cluster that just runs master components with the least helpful definition yet so far. Uh, so what the heck is a master component, you're asking? Uh, these are the components, and now they're in silver to signify their cluster components instead of things you would put deploy. Um, they're things like the scheduler, right? What actually assigns pods to your nodes, what assigns the IP addresses to the pods, the IP addresses to your services, and so on. Uh, there's the API server, so the command line utility, kubectl, talks to the API server. Really, everything talks to the API server, uh, and so on. And the big thing to keep in mind with your master components and master nodes is, if you lose them for some reason, your cluster is frozen. And I don't mean everything stops running, I mean nothing, the cluster can't change itself. So no scaling, no deploying, nothing like that. Yet external forces can still happen, you could still lose a top of rack switch, you could have power outages, and so you'd like to be able to react to those events, but of course you can't. So, when that sort of thing happens, you're talking about high availability. Uh, so the obvious straw man strategy, right, detect a failure, spin up a new one. We use Chef in our data centers, so we could do this in about 15 to 20 minutes which isn't bad, it's not crazy, especially for a prototype, but uh, we deploy at peak hours every 10 minutes, so we're holding up our deploy train and that pisses off developers. And it has other SRE ramifications too when you start having to deploy larger and larger things. Um, but the other thing is we get flash sales. And flash sales can really push our capacity limits and it turns out that they can happen and be over in less than 20 minutes. And so if we want to be able to re react to those by adding more capacity, being down for 20 minutes would really stink. So, like every good high availability strategy, we'll just run multiple at once. Uh, all of the master components are stateless and have leader election built in, so Kubernetes saw this coming, right? It's not a crazy idea. Um, and now it's just a matter of like, what strategy do you use to take advantage of running multiple at once? So an easy idea is, of course, just CNaming your masters, uh, put this in your config files, when you detect failure, use your hopefully automated DNS system, and you're down to propagation time and prop uh, timeouts to make that work. We went a step further because we have amazing networking folks who were like, hey, you can do better than that. And what they pointed out was we can essentially use any cast, right? And so, uh, again, in the config files, there's a DNS name, and it just sends requests, uh, and this is the most technical bit of jargon. If you don't understand it, don't worry about it, but uh, the DNS name is actually an A record to a virtual IP backed by an ECMP group. Like I said, just technical jargon. Don't worry about it. But essentially, it means that a request will end up at any of our healthy masters, and healthy masters is important here. As we learned the hard way, you don't want to send requests just because the master is up, just because Docker's running on that host. Really make sure that you know, it's serving API requests properly before you allow it to take traffic. Otherwise, you're gonna scratch your head with like, why are a third of my requests failing for two minutes? What's going on? Those are no fun to bother. Anyway, so this gets our failure time down to seconds. It's awesome. If you can get your traffic folks to do this, highly recommend it. So. The only reason, of course, this works is, or one of the main reasons this works, is that it's stateless. And so the way the components are stateless is they use a distributed key value store called etcd. 
uh, similar to Zookeeper, but I can only say that because I'm not so familiar with Zookeeper. Don't ask me how they work. And, you know, don't compare them under the covers, just at a high level. Um, and so again, in the same way you needed your master components to have life, Etsy needs to have a quorum, right? It's a distributed system. And so if it loses quorum, it won't accept writes. And if you can't write to it, then you may as well have frozen master nodes. And so determining the right quorum size is important. Uh, do you want three? Do you want five? Do you want seven? Go crazy. But that also brings up the question of like how to best utilize your resources. So if you're clever, you can actually get not just your etcd nodes running on your master nodes, you can actually like dynamically do this bootstrapping process and now they're like just Kubernetes pods. I wouldn't recommend that though. It has some scaling problems, like what happens when you want more etcd nodes than master nodes. And the other big philosophy we wanted to run with for our cluster was everything is disposable, right? I should be able to take down any master at any time, any, you know, just normal node at any time and not care, right? As long as I've got something else to take its place, I could take down a whole rack of them. And so now if my master nodes actually are running stateful applications, this becomes a lot harder. Um, so back to distributed systems problems, right? You need to set up a quorum. You need to figure out how to actually form the quorum. Uh, so this big stanza, which I'm hoping is legible, but might not be in the back, I'm sorry. Uh, the red box is important, right? This tells the, you know, each node, how do I find my other ones? Uh, and if you're mean, you're like, I'm typing IP addresses and I'm typing, you know, ports, this sucks, this can't be right, I'm better than that. You're not. If you're only setting this up like twice, just push that to the back of your head and do it. On the other hand, if you find yourself having to set up a lot of these, you might have more than two data centers, you might want actually lots of test clusters. Then we should talk about automation. And this is like, yes, this is the part of your brain that's like, I like automation, I like more efficient solutions. Uh, and so SRV records are the sort of go-to way to do this. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they're basically just DNS records that report back all of the servers sort of under a key, so your key here might be etcd, that are gonna participate and the ports that they're listening on. And instead of having this big red block which just gets bigger and bigger with the number of servers in your quorum, you just get to have this little black box in the middle that's like, you know, just no, look for this key and magic DNS stuff will happen. And again, if you have an automated DNS system, this gets even easier to use and work. So. We've talked about the pieces that will let you actually schedule your pods in the cluster. Let's talk about how we're actually gonna get traffic into those pods and do something useful. And that again, oh, now we'll skip that. Um, yeah, the point there was to take backups, they're important. Uh, so ingress is of course the resource that helps you get uh, requests into your cluster. Um, if you do this on premise, basically your ingress is, uh, resource is really Nginx under the covers. This totally makes sense, it's what I do. Um, and what we found is this really odd bug that every time we deployed, and we're doing that about every 10 minutes, Nginx would reload, and it would just totally forget about sort of round robin load balancing and how we've been doing it before, and we'd get hotspots. And we were getting bad hotspots. Some of our pods would be taking 10 times baseline traffic, and others would be totally starved. And we run over provisioned, but we're not 10x over provisioned, right? That's just silly. Uh, and so this was painful, but it also put another Nginx load balancer between our actual load balancing tier, which does some sophisticated stuff beyond just load balancing, and our servers. So we started looking at other ways we could do this. And of course, this makes sense for our biggest applications. For your little ones, you know, this might not be necessary. So I mentioned that, you know, earlier, think about services as sort of a DNS name that round robins. They can do even more than that. They can actually have every node, and this is why it's important to realize that nodes are a thing, not just containers, uh, expose a port. So you can say, you know what, any request that comes in to port 5002, that's really for this service, and I'll figure out how to forward it onto the correct pods. And so now the load balancers don't have to go through another layer of Nginx, they can just evenly spread traffic to your cluster. And this little uh, utility called Cube Proxy, which lives on all of your nodes for free, uh, will basically play with your IP tables and make sure the forwarding happens. And so this is another, this is pretty efficient. <laughs> But our load balancers, like I said, have some sophistication in them, and they do more than just round robin. We can actually look at uh, request, the average request time, so put more requests on faster servers. We can look at sort of the mix of things. And it's not really efficient from a network perspective, right? Sure, we're sending all the requests evenly, but then they've gotta get rerouted if we're not running pods everywhere. So we asked ourselves, can we step back and do even better than that? And it turns out we can. So we actually bypassed our service. Right? Every pod actually gets its own IP address. It's routable, so let's use that. So the load balancing tier, which is a lot of stuff in it, will actually query our cube API server, the API servers, get a list of all the running pods, their IP addresses, and we can route directly to them. And this actually is pretty similar to what we do in the data center. And it means we can go back to using sort of all of the expected load balancing algorithms we have built in. Okay, so this is sort of how you get requests in. Now if you think about being an application, you might want persistent storage. 
And this is tricky in the cluster because one of the Kubernetes rules is I, it can schedule a pod anywhere at any time. It can actually evict a pod and move it if it decides there's memory pressure. And these are all really nice behaviors. But if you're relying on local disk, getting scheduled anywhere at any time really doesn't work at all. And so the abstraction they provide for you is what they call a persistent volume, persistent volume claims. But basically think of this as like a mount point that's accessible everywhere. It's not really what it is, but that should be enough for this point. And in the data center, if you're gonna back that, we're talking about distributed file systems. Anyone ever configured one of these things? Run a distributed file system? Who wants to keep doing that? Anybody? Yeah, me either. I'd never touched one of these before, and they're complicated. And they're, they're tricky. If you think a RAID is like all you wanna get into, stay away from these. But one of the really important questions is like, how much replication should I have, right? Do I want my blocks to live on one server? Probably not. Three, five, seven again, at least on odd numbers. And you're thinking, why do I care, Danny? Like, why are we talking about this? Well, this comes back to where the heck do I wanna run these, right? If I want this super replicated, then maybe I wanna use my cluster to be the backing store for this because I've got all these servers that have all these disks in them. But I talked about earlier, like, you know, we want our nodes to be ephemeral, right? I wanna be able to take an entire rack down for maintenance. And if my backing is three or five servers and I just take 40 offline, how many different blocks did I just take offline? Like, did I just destroy my entire cluster file system? And so now you're talking about running your own storage system. So, you know, you buy these big ass for you 48 uh, slot machines, they hold a terabyte drive, and you're like, I only need a handful of these things, this will be okay. Or you just convince your CTO to buy a SAN, and things work out, but uh, I was no expert in this, and it sounds like most of you aren't either, so be careful. Okay, so the big four components, and you can sort of hear me trailing off at the end about like, we're going further and further down the rabbit hole. Uh, and for us, I would call this a successful failure because we ran production traffic on our on-premise cluster. But at the end of the day, we stepped back, and we decided that this wasn't for us. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons, but we decided that you know, the cloud made more sense than on-premise. We're not saying it always makes more sense. There are plenty of organizations doing it. But for us, we had a couple of really sticking points. Uh, upgrades were painful. So the master components are versioned. The client components are versioned. We use some plugins that are versioned. And every time we did an upgrade, it was like, what's the magic combination that all works together? And is anybody else doing these combinations? Like, are we solving new problems every time for just ourselves? And we were, it turned out. Like, we had you know, the Nginx bug. Not a lot of Google hits for what's going on there. And perhaps even more importantly is one of the things that as an organization we're trying to drive towards is really spend our effort doing things that only our organization can really do well, right? Things that are key to our business. And running a Kubernetes cluster, doesn't matter where you are, you're gonna run it the same way. It's not core to our business, right? Core to our business is making our applications better. And so we found ourselves being experts in more and more things that weren't core to our business, right? Suddenly we had to be experts in distributed file systems. And holy shit, that's hard. Right, at CED, not so hard, but we had to become good at that. You know, we're still managing our data centers, and it just on and on. And so the math didn't add up for us, and so we didn't do it. And so with that, uh, if this was interesting, you wanna hear more, we have an engineering blog, we're on Twitter, I'm Danny, I'll be in the booth after this at Shopify, uh, come find me, and I'd love to take some questions.